Good morning, and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Central Oregon. Whether you're joining us from home or perhaps from the Linus Pauling Room at the church. Our opening words are Mary Oliver's morning poem. Every morning, the world is created. Under the orange sticks of the sun, the heaped ashes of the night turn to leaves again and fasten themselves to the high branches and the ponds appear like black cloth on which are painted islands of summer lilies. If it is your nature to be happy, you will swim away along the soft trails for hours, your imagination alighting everywhere. And if your spirit carries within it the thorn that is heavier than lead, if it's all you can do to keep on trudging, there is still somewhere deep within you, a beast shouting, the earth is exactly what it wanted. Each pond with its blazing lilies is a prayer heard and answered lavishly every morning, whether or not you have ever dared to be happy, whether or not you have ever dared to pray. Now let's join together with the Unitarian Universalist Church of Palouse, Moscow, Idaho in singing Morning Has Come, or if you're in the Linus Pauling Room, hum along. Good morning again, and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Central Oregon. My name is Pat Cayley, and I'll be your worship leader today. We are an inclusive community that affirms the mind, heart, and body in our search for truth and meaning. Here you will find both comfort and challenge for your spiritual journey. Whatever your age, income, or skin color, you are welcome here. Whatever your sexual orientation, gender identity, or life story, you are welcome here. If you are full of joy this morning, or if your heart is hurting, you are welcome here. Shannon Adams will light our chalice this morning. Shannon, it's Jonathan. 
your I said, yeah. there you go yeah the, if you have a chalice at home you are welcome to light it with us now yes, i'm shannon adams and this is my granddaughter a radio spirit grace This, our chalice lighting words are from Chief Dan George of the Tuslewa Tooth Nation of North Vancouver, British Columbia. The beauty of the trees, the softness of the air, the fragrance of the grass speaks to me. The summit of the mountain, the thunder of the sky, the rhythm of the sea speaks to me. The strength of the fire, the thunder of the sky, the rhythm of the sea speaks to me. The taste of salmon, the trail of the sun, and the life that never goes away, they speak to me. Please join us in singing Spirit of Life. today so I'm filling in and I have today's announcements. A special warm welcome to everyone who is joining us today especially those of you who might be tuning in to Zoom our Zoom worship for the first or second time. Please let us know if you're visiting uh, you can write that in the chat uh, during joys and sorrows in a few minutes or fill out the virtual visitor information form that link will be in the chat. Just click on that and if you'd like to sign up for our weekly ACE, the all congregational email, that way you can learn about what is happening at UUFCO in the future. Today is the first Sunday that we can be together in our building to watch the Zoom service together in the Linus Pauling Hall. Um, today through September 5th, you can come to the church and enjoy the service with other congregants. We ask that uh, everyone be masked while in the building, and for now, we won't be able to sing together. Hopefully, we'll be able to sing together um, sometime soon. Last Tuesday was our first sound bath with Kevin Kraft as we launched UUFCO's Wellness Tuesdays. And uh, sorry, there was a little bit of conflicting information, but the actual starting time is 6 p.m. So the actual starting time is 6 p.m. for uh, Wellness Tuesdays. So come to the gathering hall for a little early with your own yoga mat or blanket or pillow if you need one. Uh, after a bit of light yoga and breath work, uh, we'll lie on the floor to experience the amazing sound and vibrations of gongs and bells. $15 to $20 is requested, but no one will be turned away for lack of funds. A big thank you to Jonathan Beal, who has organized our Wellness Tuesdays. Just a friendly reminder, if you're filling the blue bags for bottle and can recycling, please take extra care not to include bags, crushed cans, or items that do not have the Oregon recycling information. Um, the Recycling Center has made complaints about some of our participants' bag contents, and they've threatened to terminate our account. They are pretty selective, even sometimes dented cans they won't take. Um, this has been such a successful fundraiser for our social justice programs. Um, so please give it your attention and care going forward so we can keep, uh, keep that source of funding coming in. 
A couple of things from this week's ace, Wildcat Wizards tutoring is ready to resume in the fall and we need a co-leader to make it a strong program. Uh, so please see the ACE for more information. The Soul Matters programming is offering a special retreat called Spinning Gold on August 14th and 15th with an introductory session on August 11th. Again, the ACE has all the information you need uh, to see if this is calling to you. And as Chela would say, blessings on your day. Good morning, I'm Amy Brock and I serve as the Director of Religious Exploration for Children and Youth. Today we are exploring poetry and I wonder if anyone here has ever written a poem before. Can I see your hands if you've ever written a poem? I imagine there are quite a few of us here. Poems are really special because they have the power to connect us in ways that other forms of literacy, like books and news articles, just don't do quite as well, or maybe they do in a different kind of way. They allow us to not only learn about someone else's experience, but to feel it as if we were right there too. The curious thing about poetry is that most of the time, we only get to experience it from one person's perspective because one person writes the poem. And we know that most of the time when there's a story or an experience that someone is sharing, that there are usually two or more sides to that story. Everybody experiences things a little bit differently. I had a really great experience with some of our elementary students from UUFCO and other congregations in our PNW region last month at our virtual wizard camp. As head of the Truth and House, which in the Universalist Wizarding World stands for Truth and Peace, one of our activities was to write a poem that would become our house chant for the week. We would say this chant to each other throughout the day, and then we would perform it for all of our visitors at the end of the week. So how do you write a chant or a poem that includes everyone's experiences and perspectives? How do you make sure that all voices are heard and all experiences are felt when you share that? This was our challenge for the week. We realized as we started to explore this in our Truth and House that the first thing that we needed to do was to figure out how to include our mascot because they were really, really important. And the mascot of the Truth and House is a dolphin. And we realized as we explored how this dolphin would make our way into our collective poem together that they really needed a name. And so, in the spirit of truth and peace and all of our Unitarian Universalist wizard principles, we took a vote to decide what the name of our dolphin would be. So we included everyone. Many ideas were discussed until it came to be that our dolphin should have four names. And they were eventually named Harmony Trufin Crystal Tolphin. Next, we decided that in addition to our mascot, now with a name, that our chant should include our house values of truth and peace and also fairness because it was really important to the wizards and their house leader that everyone get a turn who wanted one throughout the week. And we worked really hard to achieve that together. So when we put all of these thoughts and ideas together, our chant sounded something like this. Truth, trust, peace, fair, these can take you anywhere. Harmony, Trufin, Crystal, Tolfin, that is our beloved dolphin. We are the Trufin. And if I just shared this chant with you all this morning without that story I just told you behind it, it would probably just sound like another camp chant, one that you probably heard before. You wouldn't know anything about how we combined our shared and individual experiences to create something that represented our values and care for one another. Today, you are appreciating our finished product, our finished poem that only took a few moments to read, but it took us almost two hours to write. And from this, we learned some things. 
we learned that writing poetry is not something that can be rushed if we want everyone's voice to be heard. We learned that it's worth spending time listening to those that we care for, that everybody's voice deserves to be heard, and that we can have a plan and we can change our minds about that plan if we get new ideas, that we can do hard things, and that hard things can be really fun if we support one another in that process. There are so many things that we can learn from the practice of writing and sharing poetry together. I wonder what other things we might learn today as we explore this practice together, both as individuals and as a people of Unitarian Universalist faith. And so ends our time together. Please join me in saying our children's covenant. In this place, I am kind. In this place, I am loving. In this place, I am a friend to the earth and all animals and people. In this place, I am loved. Elizabeth Stouter, our participant in the Poetry Connection Circle, will offer her reflection on poems as a gift to mere beauty. Hi there, my name is Elizabeth and I have loved poetry since I was a tiny child and would write poems on napkins at restaurants. I wanted to tell you a little story about how poems can be used as gifts to other people to mirror the beauty that we see in them. This is a picture of my amazing typewriter that my partner gave me as a birthday gift last winter. And here's me, hi. I decided to use the typewriter to give a gift to all of my friends. So I said to whoever wanted to could send me a word or a phrase and I would type them a poem on one sheet of paper and it would just be a one time and whatever came out, came out. And I sent these poems by snail mail to my friends. Here's a picture of some of those poems that came out over the holiday and new year. And here's one I'll read to you now. It's called Trust. Trust the panels that hold the house, steadily placed by sturdy hands. Trust the woods beyond the house, through which winter fox and blackbird wander. Trust the skin that holds the bones and organs bathed in a hearty fluid. Trust the space beyond the skin, which gently tickles, tingles, strokes. Trust the trunk which holds the branches and the leaves that freely dance. Trust the timing of the snapping, a stem from twig to be carried on wind. And trust the sighing, staying power of the stark and barren limb. Trust what goes, trust what comes, trust the rhythm of the moon and sun. Trust what is simple, trust what is near, trust what is now, trust what is here. Let what comes come at the hour that's ready. Trust through the flux, trust what is steady. And this is a book of poetry and drawings that my coworker and I were for school teachers at a preschool we made as a goodbye gift to all of our students at the end of the year, this last June. My co-teacher did the drawings and I wrote the poems. For each of our students in our class chose their own animal name that they went by this year. And so they each received a page in this book with their name and their picture. And so I'll read you this last one for Scrub J. Quiet and watchful in a nearby tree. But if you get close to her, you'll see. Her eyes are a glimmer, wings ready to flap, to sing a song 
or munch a snack. She flits from nest to limb to branch, to friend to teacher, around then back. All the while, a timid smile, breaking out into chirps of glee, so free. Curious carer, finding her words, passionate and able to share the table, now that she knows her worth, her treasure. Buried in her heart is the deepest pleasure. Scrub Jay, I see you, dazzling flyer. Your love for yourself takes you higher and higher. Well, that certainly filled me with joy. And you may be joyful this morning, or you may be carrying a heavy burden. This is a time for sharing our joys and sorrows with the community that has gathered, and the chat is now open for sharing. Both poetry and music have been uh, forms of expression and communication to really um, express our inner selves, our hearts, and to connect with others. And I find it especially meaningful and powerful when they're combined. And so much music has been written to poetry. And the piece I'm going to play this morning as you share your joys and sorrows is such a piece written by Gabrielle Fauré. Uh, it's A Prez en Rev, and it is based on a poetry uh, written anonymously in Tuscany, Italy, many, many years ago. This morning, we're celebrating the gifts of poetry. Not just the poems we read in books or might have studied in school, 
but the poetry that's alive in the world, it's everywhere if we stop and notice. The Youth Poet Laureate of the United States, Amanda Gorman, who actually we heard this morning um, at the end of Jonathan's wonderful, wonderful playlist, offered us this gift with her poem, The Hill We Climb, which she wrote for President Biden's inauguration. In the, that dark time that we had gone through, her stirring words reminded me that there is always light if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. I wasn't expecting to cry during the inauguration, but that poem and her performance of it released emotions that had been building in me for months. My soul was hungry for that wake, wake up call, that encouragement to expect more and to work for better days. Poems can do that, at least they can for me. They can offer nourishment or inspiration when I need it most. So have you ever experienced that time when you came across a poem just at the right moment, words that spoke directly to your heart or to the need you were feeling? I'd like you just to take a moment and think about that. Call up a few words or the spirit of that poem or that poet who moved you and gave you that gift. So with the mysterious alchemy of words that create images, sound and movement, poems can do so many things. They can lift us up, they can comfort us, Sometimes they can shock us, they can make us laugh or bring us to tears. But above all, they make us notice. And as Amy suggests this morning, they can also connect us. Joseph Rue calls poetry truth in its Sunday clothes, but it's not just for Sundays. It can be dressed in the, it can be dressed for the street speaking of everyday things. Some of the most powerful and musical poetry that's around these days is really the pavement poetry of hip hop and spoken word um, infused with the idioms of the street and the cadences of rap and jazz. That poetry sometimes confuses me or unsettles me, but it can take me places I haven't been before. It can be fierce and raw what Alice Walker calls the lifeblood of rebellion, revolution, and the raising of consciousness. I feel that energy and challenge in the work of the many young writers inspired by the Black Lives Matter and other liberation movements. Or poetry can be quieter, more reflective, and meditative. It can be a mantra. It can be a simple prayer as Mary Oliver reminds us in her poem, Praying, when she urges us to pay attention, then patch together a few words and don't try to make them elaborate. This isn't a contest, but a doorway. Poems are doorways, or sometimes they're windows or bridges. They're reflections of what we didn't necessarily know we knew until the poet spoke it for us, or when the poet in us found a voice. So what gifts and revelations have poems offered you? And what words have you written in the margins, on the back of envelopes, perhaps in your journal? What seed of a poem is lying fallow in you, a poem that only you can write. We've explored these questions in the Poetry Connection Circle at UUFCO that's met online every two weeks for the last year. It's a changing group and all are welcome. Each one of us brought one or two poems to share at each session, either poems by others or poems that we'd written. And we've already heard from Elizabeth Stouter about how she gave the gift of her poems to her friends and her young students. And now Chandra Smith and Anastasia Compton will reflect on how 
they too have found inspiration in writing and reading poetry. Good morning, I'm Chandra. And <clears throat> when I was in the seventh grade, I wrote a poem, The Secrets of the Seashell, which Mrs. Epstein, my English teacher, regarded as somewhat brilliant. My mother did not. And from that day forward, any writing assignment I was given always had two versions, one for my mother and one for me or my teacher. This continued throughout high school and even into college as I lived at home. My adult years were consumed with external businesses, jobs, career, graduate school, and family. It was not until my elder years when I was slowed down by a stroke that my desire to write returned. I found myself again writing poetry asking or answering questions or refinding memories that were important to me. I found that in the practice <clears throat> of meditation, <clears throat> in the quiet that comes with it, although not always, that the questions I focused on often evoked the poetic responses. Two of these poems I will now share with you. The first is called Going Home Remembered. Just below the fish hatchery on the Metolius, just beyond the bridge, our canvas canoe burst into the air, caught between the canyon walls that lined the river and the rapidly rushing flow that was between them. The kayak reached for the sky and threw the riders into the river. One rider's head hit the canyon wall on the right side, and then she was swept into the current. The other rider, seeing what had happened, followed behind until he could see her hair floating to the surface. Then he grabbed it and held on to it through the rapids for as long as he could. Finally, he released her and she was on her own, floating through the rapids with her own body as the compass until she finally floated joyously onto the river's surface and she saw the gray sky open briefly. Then she slipped through it into a higher plane with a bright shining sun. And she knew in that quiet gentleness and in deep humility that she was going home. When suddenly startled, she awakened to find herself floating into a wide open pool with a somewhat surprised lone trout fisherman. Seeing her dilemma, he waded into the river and with his strong arms lifted her out and stood her on her feet so she could walk towards the shore. To celebrate Father's Day with her husband who finally floated into view and with her small son who was being held in a friend's arms on the bridge they left behind. With gratitude in her heart for taking this river trip and traveling through the sky to a home unknown, she knew she would forever remember it as a glimpse of her final trip. My second poem I found rather than refinding a memory, was answering some questions that I have deep within my soul. This poem is called Haya Sophia, Where Are You, Holy Wisdom? How I long to see the feminine face of God. She has long been eradicated from most writings, works of art, or music. She has been taken over by many male wisdom figures. And though they speak to me of important matters in this very patriarchal society, they say little about my female soul 
as it unfolds. If you are there, Hagia Sophia, your presence is much needed. As I long to find the balance between the mas my masculine and feminine self, that part of me, <clears throat> which is the feminine soul self, I have kept in or curtailed so, to such an extent that I question what is the real me. Thank you for listening. And I will now turn it over to another member of the poetry group, Anastasia Compton, who will share what she has to say about poetry with you. Hi, good morning. I'm Anastasia. <clears throat> poetry, both the reading and the writing of it, is a practice of liberation. Christina Domenic teaches poetry in a prison in Buenos Aires. And before her students started writing, she had them read poems. And because there's a range of literacy levels among the inmates, she introduced short, powerful pieces. In her TED talk, she describes the experience. She says, by reading such short poems, they all began to realize that what the poetic language did was to break a certain logic and create another system. Breaking the logic of language also breaks the logic of the system under which they've learned to respond. In other words, poetry is a practice of liberation because it challenges our assumptions about the world by challenging our assumptions about the language we use to describe it. And at times it challenges some very core assumptions of our society, leading to some pushback. In 1957, City Lights founder Lawrence Ferlinghetti and bookstore manager Shig Morau faced obscenity charges for publishing and selling Allen Ginsberg's famous poem, Howl. Howl touches on subjects of mental illness, drug use, materialism, conformity, sexuality, freedom, and repression. The words and phrases that it uses to do so are vividly descriptive and sometimes deliberately explicit. The threshold on which Judge Clayton Horn was asked to rule was whether the poem had redeeming social value that justified the use of the language. Now, spoiler alert, he decided it did. Because the language that Ginsburg uses in Howell was uncomfortable according to the social rules of 1950s America. But this is intertwined with the poem's aim to draw attention to uncomfortable truths. In his ruling, Judge Horn said, no hard and fast rule can be fixed for the determination of what is obscene, because such a determination depends on the locale, the time, the mind of the community and the prevailing mores. He then goes on to quote Oliver Wendell Holmes. A word is not a crystal, transparent and unchanged. It is the skin of living thought and may vary greatly in color and content according to the circumstances and the time in which it is used. Now, we don't need to be living in an Argentinian prison or living through the upheaval of the beat generation to benefit from using poetry to break the logic of everyday language and approach words as living thoughts. We all live within patterns that need challenging both internal and external, and poetry can open doors that we believed to be tightly locked. When William Sieghart was at a literary festival promoting an anthology that he had edited, a friend had the idea that instead of the traditional author meet and greet, he should prescribe poems from the book to each person who stopped by. The allotted hour for this passed and then another and another as people lined up to tell a bit of their story and receive a poem that might offer them just a bit of perspective or comfort or joy. 
In his subsequent book, The Poetry Remedy, he organizes chapters according to the burden or challenge one might be facing, and then suggests a poem to open the door to healing. For self-recrimination, Mary Oliver's Wild Geese. Wendell Berry's The Peace of Wild Things is suggested for anxiety. For situations of oppression, Maya Angelou's Still I Rise. So I'll leave you with this. What would be in your own poetry pharmacy? If you were to take a notebook and fill it with poems that have had an impact on you, lyrics to songs that take you back, readings from weddings and memorials, what would it contain? Ask friends for a favorite poem that is significant to them. Make notes on each poem, what it heals or stirs within you. Read the poems out loud or listen to them. What would happen if you were to forget all the classes and books that demanded that you identify every metaphor in a poem and be able to explain the right meaning and began instead to practice poetry as an act of liberation? Thank you. Our closing song, We Are, was written and directed by Dr. Yusei Barnwell and sung by the UAA General Assembly Virtual Choir in 2020. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. For each child that's born. Sings to the universe who we are. We are our grandmother's prayers, and we are our grandfather's dreamings, and we are the breath of our ancestors. We are the spirit of God. We are mothers of courage, fathers of time, daughters of dust. And the sons of great visions were sisters of mercy, brothers of love, lovers of life, and the builders of nations were seekers of truth, keepers of faith, makers of peace, and the wisdom of ages. We are our grandmother's prayers. We Sons of great visions we 
sisters of mercy, brothers of love, lovers of life, and the builders of nations, we're seekers of truth and keepers of faith. We are makers of peace and the wisdom of ages. We are our grandmother's prayers. We we are our grandfather's dreamings and we are the breath of our ancestors. We are the spirit of God. We are our grandmother's prayers and we are our grandfather's dreamings. We are the breath of our ancestors. We are the spirit of God. sings to the universe who we are. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who If you have lit a chalice at home, I invite you to extinguish it now as we say our covenant together. Love is the spirit of this fellowship. Love is the spirit of this fellowship and service is its law. This is our covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. Now, as we head off into this summer day, I offer you this closing invitation from Sarah Moores Campbell. We receive fragments of holiness, glimpses of eternity, brief moments of insight. Let us gather them for the precious gifts they are and renewed by their grace, mold, move boldly into the unknown. And, why not also tuck a few poems into your backpack as you head off on your August adventures? So thank you for being here. If you would like to connect with a small group after the service, please stay online. And after Peggy's closing music, you'll be automatically put into one or more breakout rooms, depending on, on how many people we have gathered. Our discussion question for today is, how has poetry played a role in your spiritual life?